Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Joseph Kappas, and I'm here with my guest, Dr. Nick Studholm, who practices out in Colorado. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Nick. Awesome. I'm looking forward to being here. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we were going to talk today about some some sports performance, specifically as it may relate to maybe soccer and running. Those are s- certain areas of your interest. Uh, mine as well, and you consult with a lot of athletes in those worlds, so I'm really excited to hear what uh, what you have to talk about. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm interested um, with every guest to find out how they got into their particular area of interest or their field of interest. So what, what led you to this path? Well, I'll try to be concise. I know... Um... It, that's hard. Uh, so I've been in practice almost 20 years, and so it's definitely been an evolution. Um, I grew up playing sports. I grew up actually seeing a chiropractor for that reason, and uh, I felt like every time I had a minor injury, they they had the ability to sort of get me back, whereas I was told to rest by other professions. Uh, when I when I went to school, I had I was seeing an applied kinesiology doc, uh, and he mostly. Uh, maybe specialized in chronic uh, immune and health-related issues. But nonetheless, that was my exposure to to it. So while I was in school, I took several hundred hours of AK, and I was really disenfranchised with manual muscle testing. I felt like it was easily manipulated and that kind of thing. In my last uh, maybe quarter of school, a guy by the name of Dr. Craig Bueller came to school, uh, and he had worked with Alan Beardall, who, who created this clinical kinesiology. But what Craig... Uh, had done is working with the University of Utah. So he used a handheld dynamometer, a FET system, to measure force over time, and he was able to show that there is a reproducible way to muscle test, and you can actually learn to muscle test. Learn meaning you can create a, a, a consistent force over time, and and reproducibly show that. And that was important for me because I think anybody who muscle tests or manually muscle tests. Uh, never gets trained in actually muscle testing, and then they're using that as a diagnostic output, but they're not actually using a, a uh, an objective tool because they have no biofeedback to it. Right. Um, at the time, Craig was the full-time chiropractor for the Utah Jazz, and that really sparked my interest. So I was worked with Craig for two years in and out and got to work on a lot of those guys with him or at his side, really. And that had a massive influence on sort of my direction. And then, you know, from there, it was a matter of uh, uh, at each level saying, gee, is is my eyeball seeing what I think it's seeing? Uh, maybe not. Maybe I should hook up a camera. And so me and a few guys, when the iPad came out, we created a motion capture app so we could sort of measure things real time in the in the authentic, authentic environment. Awesome. And um, and then, the, you know, the next phase for me is I got this thing called an OptiGate, which was a. Uh, a, a, you know, next level sort of thing you put on your treadmill. You could jump people. It, it led to some EMG, and now I have a plantar pressure treadmill, and I have sort of a 3D lab and forest plates. And so I have to say it's sort of selfish, but it keeps me interested in practice. And also just asking the question is, are, are the results I'm getting really the results I think I'm getting? Or mm-hmm. am I measuring things the way I think I'm measuring them? And, uh, and I think it's easy as a practitioner to take credit for something getting better or being different because it feels better when maybe we actually haven't really changed the mechanics or, or, or the variables we think we're changing. So that's a long-winded answer into sort of that direction, but it really started with that. Uh, I think the technique is now, well, I know it is, advanced muscle integration technique that Craig Buehler teaches, but at the mm-hmm. time it was chiro mat or clinical kinesiology. Okay. And you, you touched on uh, the muscle testing aspect. And for those who may not be aware of uh of what muscle testing is can you kind of talk about that and what it tells you clinically absolutely so i want to be first clear i'm not a diplomat in applied kinesiology i I have taken probably six or seven hundred hours i never sat for the test i had some you know there for other reasons but um so my my interpretation over questioning it each time because it's so you're using a, a muscle test uh, different than a Kendall and Kendall type of grading for 
neurologic weakness, but you're using it as a sort of a binary event. Either either you can find it, control it, and engage it, or you can't. So when we measure uh, the way we muscle test, when we measure it with a, a system, we'll look at a force over time curve. And we know that in about a second and a half to two seconds, there should be a certain rate of rise to about tw anywhere between 25 to 30 pounds of pressure. And then a patient should be able to sustain that and then you can stop the test. And the idea is uh, that people link it to all sorts of things. Um, and I think that's just a, a little bit of a rabbit hole. I personally sort of believe that a lot of the techniques in applied kinesiology came out of bad muscle testing. So we went down a rabbit hole saying it means this to mean that. The only thing I really link to manual muscle testing is the idea of can I find it and engage it in that place? So it's almost a proprioceptive feedback. Can I find the muscle and time it appropriately? That's all I'm really at. That's the only um, uh, sort of value I'll put on it. I, I, you know, I don't link it to an organ or a gland or a, or anything else like that. It's just simply can I identify it in this space and time it accordingly? And I use it as a feedback tool for uh, maybe a lack of proprioceptive input in that moment or ability to to engage it absolutely and i mean working with athletes like you do um and you know there's they obviously feel like they they're strong and they should absolutely. be able to outpower overpower you and then when you're able to uh you know basically show that these these muscles are weak and that you can overpower them with very little force, I'm assuming. And, you know, I'm sure that speaks volumes to them. And yeah, it does, you know, and, uh, I know you work with Dr. Traster, but and he, he speaks to this a fair bit, but athletes really do like some sort of real time feedback. Um, so we have to be careful to be clear that the muscle may or may not be weak. You can have an inhibited muscle that's weak and an inhibited muscle that's strong. Uh, by inhibition, it's really just a timing event, but athletes, are blown away by it. I can think of some linemen that I've worked on who, you know, these 350 pound guys and they have a hard time controlling a small muscle and they just want you to do it again and again and again, thinking somehow they're going to cheat their nervous system, <laughs> but you know, they can't, they can't seem to. So it's a, it's a remarkable thing, but it's a nice feedback tool in the context of lots of other information. So I use many other diagnostic tools to, to corroborate that information. To, uh, the muscle testing, you were mentioning a lot of other uh, rehab or, uh, excuse me, diagnostic tools that you have in your clinic. Uh, can you touch on some of those and how they've been beneficial and made Absolutely. a difference for uh, for a lot of these athletes? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I, I we look at gait in, in every individual, uh, walking gait, running gait if we can. Uh, we have, so we have a, a, a planner pressure treadmill, but it also, so that will measure all of the uh, temporal parameters of, of gait. So uh, heel strike to foot strike uh, to toe off and all of the time spent there, the distances, the pressures, et cetera. I have what are called IMUs, which are inertial movement units that you hook up to different body parts and it creates a 3D um, avatar of the individual and therefore can give us uh, joint angles of movement and yeah. Gait has some good um, uh, normative data, and so we'll hook up the uh, uh, that. We have EMG, which mostly I use as biofeedback because there's a lot of issues with um, really what is EMG telling us, um, and we have some force plates. Uh, all of that information, because walking, for example, as you as you well know, is mostly a subcortical thing, and so it's it's mostly reflexogenic. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully you're not using a lot of executive function to to exe to, to walk. Hopefully. Um, so as you were in single support, for example, or in stance walking, we can see really what kind of control you have at the hip, which might be very different than a step down, although it might also correlate. But a step down could be a very conscious, um, you know, frontal lobe driven event where I'm consciously focusing on the step down. My control might be far greater than what it is in gait. So gait's a really neat window into what is a uh, an opportunity, and then I might link that to my muscle testing, see if there's a correlative. Mm -hmm. So from a biomechanics thing, we use that. And then I've really gotten interested in these MOXIE sensors that we use that are, they measure basically uh, tissue oxygenation at the capillary level. Okay. 
So you place them on a muscle and you have someone do a, a certain exertional test or training. And what you can see is how well they're actually able to utilize oxygen mm -hmm. or deplete. And, um, and that's fascinating because you can see a lot of athletes struggle with either a utilization and or a supply issue. And you might really quickly modify their, their training accordingly. Yeah. And so from a patient education standpoint, it seems like it's, it's pretty easy to explain with these tools where, you know, their biomechanics are breaking down and that gives you a much better idea of how you need to fix it in a much more accurate manner. Absolutely. And, and, you know, again, it depends on sort of the worlds you live in. There's a lot of argument in the pain science world about do biomechanics matter or not. And I definitely live in a camp that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and most people just sort of have this feeling, well, teach people to move differently. They, they had the bi same biomechanics before the pain. They, you can teach around the pain and, you know, the whole cognitive behavioral um, CBT type of an idea. All of that, I think, has value, but I still think you, you need to fix the biomechanics. Mm -hmm. And so I'm definitely operating from that camp, which is different than, I think, a lot of uh, people out there who, who are de-emphasizing the biomechanics. But ultimately, you know, we, we see so many degenerative changes and over time <clears throat> that, you know, I think the challenge in biomechanics has always been uh, that you can get something stronger, but the recruitment patterns don't necessarily improve. So there's a lot of research that says, you know, we do a rehab study with somebody, here's the weaknesses, we hook up EMG the week before the activity, we do a, a movement pattern to look at motor timing, then we do our rehab, everyone gets stronger, we recheck the movement pattern, and there was not an improvement in motor recruitment. So it's like, wow, that's weird, I got stronger, but I can't recruit this tissue any better. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that is a missing component to biomechanics. And I think that's where, uh, uh, not a shameless pitch, but where the FNOR approach, the functional neuroorthopedic rehab, where you sort of try to leverage a little more of the nervous system has a lot of value. Because the idea is if we can change those, those, those motor cortices and, and change that smudging and grow that real estate, we might be able to change the chronic pattern. So I know it's a sort of long-winded answer, but the bottom line is biomechanics to me really do matter. And, uh, and I know there's a subset of people out there that feel like uh, we're, we're too caught up on biomechanics. Absolutely. And there are multiple layers of good and bad biomechanics. I mean, you can look at, the, you know, you're talking about firing patterns and maybe joint mechanics. But how has, like you teach in the FNOR courses, how has kind of looking more... Um, cortically and centrally at those aspects of the nervous system, how has that changed the way you approach someone's altered biomechanics? Uh, profoundly, really. Um, it, from the perspective of, um, I just realized that what I was doing to try to create a change. Now, let's be clear. Let's, just, let's, let's refine this to a chronic injury for a moment because we have to imply that, that the Although we know things change pretty quickly, acutely, we're learning that actually maybe chronic it shouldn't be defined by a timeline, um, because you know, but it maybe by what changes in the brain. Uh, but if we're talking chronic pain or chronic injury, there isn't an athlete out there that doesn't have a chronic injury they're currently playing with. They all they all do, right? Mm -hmm. um, what has changed is the reality that the rehab is not nearly intense enough to create the changes we need to create that's going to make that plastic change to, to affect things. And so I think, you know, as we say, as a joke, you might be doing three sets of 10 of something. Uh, you know, I'm just not sure how that changes somebody who, who's going to, um, you know, cover 15 K in a game in soccer. It just doesn't, I'm not sure that those two are correlative. And so what has changed for me massively is the intensity with which we, we do our rehab. And um, also simple things to, you know, uh, I know you know this better than I do, but whether we're using temporal or spatial summation, but ways in which we can leverage something with the nervous system while we're doing an activity mm -hmm. and, and, and have those two prime it and then activate it and get hopefully a, a, a more robust change in the nervous system. Absolutely. And I think people do that regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, without actually thinking through the why. 
And uh, it's just helped refine the process. So instead of somebody juggling on a gym ball or a BOSU ball or something ridiculous, at least, you know, if we're doing something to affect the nervous system, we have a thought process to the why and then, and then what we want to leverage from there. Yeah, absolutely. Can you give us an example of maybe a typical patient for you or maybe one of your favorite cases uh, that came in and you were able to utilize kind of all these aspects of, uh, of your treatment approaches? and uh, the, the impacts that that had on that player? Yeah, so, you know, it was interesting. I think of one player um, in particular uh, uh, who, who was playing in, in, in England who had some uh, really chronic low back pain, mm-hmm. uh, the kind of pain where he had uh, difficulty. So he'd play through his games, but uh, in the UK they call a grocery cart a trolley, but when he would um, shop, you know, he'd, he pushed the trolley around after a game and said his back was killing him. So it was really a matter of just his life outside of the game sucked because he had this back pain. And he had been with this for many years, and he had, um, in theory, seen lots of people. Now, that said, you know, I have a ton of failure, so it's not like everyone who... <laughs> but this was a neat case. So interestingly enough, he had had a, 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 a fracture and a pin with, uh, uh, put into uh, his left foot, um, uh, and so in a break he'd had many years earlier. And as I, we took him through our movement eval and our gait, it became very clear that there was an issue in that left ankle. And when I asked him how, how the left ankle was doing, he said, mate, it's great. It's totally healed up, no pain, nothing. Uh, but for me, it was really a movement component to his dysfunction. Um, so he also had, you know, this classic pattern of, of uh, peripheral nerve irritation around his cluneal nerves, and I wouldn't have considered that in the past. Mm -hmm. And so in identifying his gait pattern and then uh, identifying that an injury, which to him is pain-free and wasn't a problem, but was still massively impacting his biomechanics, we're able to address that very quickly, treat the, the neurogenic inflammation. And, you know, we laugh about it today at six or seven years later and, um, you know, he's had other injuries, but one of the things he never talks about is back pain. It's, you know, it's, it's completely resolved. And he does say to me, which is a neat thing to hear, is he says, you know, I, my career aside, um, you know, what, what's changed and what's been so powerful for me is my day-to-day, I'm not living with this chronic pain. And, you know, you'd like to think it'd be neat if he won this championship or this trophy, but for the, the reality, it was, it was a life-changing thing for him. Yeah. And that's probably more impactful than, than, you know, scoring this goal or that goal because, you know, that... Those are life changing, but I didn't have anything to do with the goal scoring. But I know we had some result to do with his back feeling a lot. Absolutely. And you know, everyone had been treating the back, and yes, we did some things for the back, but that wasn't the key component really in this case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, is that something you see uh, a lot with uh, with these athletes, as far as having maybe long standing issues uh, following? you know, a long career in sports where now they have these maybe seemingly random injuries that kind of result from years of playing on poor biomechanics? I think so. You know, I think these athletes are masterful compensators. And again, this is a ton, no research to support this comment, just all opinion, but they're master compensators. And it's really until they've just blown through every possible compensation that they start to break down. Yeah. And, and, um, and you see that and, you know, they're being put back together and when you're inside these clubs, uh, you get to see that, um, in some of them, the care is wonderful. And in some of them, the care is really average and, um, and, you know, it speaks to a whole nother side of medicine where you, you, you're just barely paying a staff to be there and you're paying, you know, these players millions of dollars. And it's sort of an interesting conundrum of why you're not, you know, bringing in that quality, but the other side of it is, uh, interestingly enough, at that level, some of these guys just get sick of showing up every day and training, and you know they've been doing it since they were nine or ten. Yeah, and their interest level in getting better sometimes wanes a little bit. Um, so, you know, one exercise more outside of or is, is hard to do. Uh, but absolutely think that uh, there just isn't a high-level athlete um, that that isn't sort of dealing with these sort of chronic issues um, and. There's just so much opportunity there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you have, um, outside of uh, 
you know, rehabbing a lot of these guys who obviously need a lot of work or girls, gals. Um, do you get a lot of people who want to improve their sports performance as far as, you know, stepping up to the next level of the game? And what are some strategies that you like to implement uh, to get them there? Yeah, so I, I do. I, I would say it's mostly more in the uh, – so you get this occasion, you'll find the rare athlete that is willing to do extra. Mm-hmm. So I work close with the University of Denver, and a lot of their athletes have gone pro either in hockey and soccer, uh, some in lacrosse, at least the, the ones I've worked with. And um, they're looking for any edge. Uh, they know us. They trust that we've done a good job with them through their four years at school. And so we can use they're, – they're very open to these ideas that I'm going to share with you. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it typically is a um, somebody who's maybe a triathlete or a marathoner or somebody who's looking to cut some time. And uh, and so the things that I'm always looking for are what are things that we can do that don't add volume to your training? Uh, so there's no more physical demand as it relates to load on the body or tissues, but, but that will improve. Mm-hmm. And there's two that come to mind. I mentioned the MOXIE sensors. Um, If we can improve how somebody is delivering O2 to the tissue and recovering, uh, then we can make some really substantial changes and and speed up recovery, actually. So, you know, there are tricks to teaching uh, once they learn how and they strengthen appropriately. And a lot of it, much of it has to do with breathing, but we're using um, something called a Spiro Tiger, which is a, uh, they actually have an inflatable bag you blow into so you're you're getting resistance on respiration and inspiration and you're training quite intensely so it's not like just a, a diaphragmatic breathing it's a much more intense breathing technique but if you can train people to coordinate that well um, you can get them to recover you can teach them some tricks to breathe very aggressively to blow out as much co2 as possible to to then allow the hemoglobin myoglobin to reoxygenate more and more intensely and deliver better mm-hmm. So there's neat ways to teach just recovery within a moment or a game or, uh, and that will aid in performance for sure, as well as frankly, just overall better exchange is going to create a, a more robust athlete. Uh, and the Moxie helps guide that uh, mm-hmm. quite well. Uh, the other thing we use is, um, uh, it was developed, it's an app called um, Soma, and it was developed by this, this uh, uh, guy, Grant Hayes. Uh, but it's based on some work by, uh, well, originally by uh, on some work, some PhD. Uh, I think they're Italian, but they're working in England. But uh, Walter Staetano and um, shoot, it'll come to me. Um, the other, the other gentleman. But it's basically this idea that um, fatigue actually is about perception of effort. Mm. It's not a metabolic limiter. Now, yes, you not being, I don't know how fit you are, but let's pretend you're not very fit. Yes, then fitness is going to be a limit to your <laughs> fatigue, right? Right. But let's assume that someone's quite fit. Mm-hmm. What they're able to show is in, in a variety of very interesting studies that people stop because almost of a level of disinterest. So, mm. uh, but but it's but when they so they've done things where they put people on a watt bike and they have them pedal into maximum exertion uh, at a consistent wattage and they just can't turn over the pedal one more at that moment they put tourniquets on the leg they biopsy the muscle and they look to see you know what's left and what they've come up with is there's probably seven to ten minutes more of 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 metabolic uh, substrate available to to go Mm -hmm. so the question is why is that person stop and they also show that if they stop them right there because they can't do one more thing and then they say for the next five seconds go as hard as you can they can actually produce twice or three times the wattage they could produce and the, the idea is there's the perception of effort. So if, if you only have five more seconds to go, the effort's worth it, right? Yeah. So they're not shutting down because of that. Uh, and so the idea is if you can train the brain, almost teach it to be fatigued, if you will. Mm-hmm. So the idea is you do these terrible, like a Stroop test, for example, uh, and you might do a Stroop test for 30 minutes. Um, and the idea is you're inducing this fatigue and then you're training on that cognitive fatigue. And it, and the the research is pretty cool. That shows that there's very little um, change in your lact, uh, heart rate, any of these markers. So there's no increased metabolic demand, but your perception of everything you do is going to be more challenging. 
Over time, though, you become more efficient, and that's what the research is showing that over time these guys are, are you know, it's it's a 130% longer time to fatigue. Their speed is better. Their recognition of things is better later in a game. Their ability to think under fatigue is better. So for me, that's just the next frontier of those last few uh, bits, and, and it really takes, uh, you know, the, again, it, uh, maybe three 30-minute sessions once you've built up a, a week of, of doing these activities mm -hmm. and there's just no added physical load right yeah so it's a really cool way to enhance your performance uh to increase your time to fatigue uh to have better decision making under fatigue but for no added uh, uh volume yeah that's brilliant so trying to train these guys after they're already at a level of fatigue so that when they're in the competition and they get to that point of fatigue they are much better prepared for it than that's the thought. Yeah. yeah, and there's just I mean, you would know the neuro better than I. I mean, there's some thought about the the buildup of adenosine mm -hmm. uh, essentially, and that it's partially why caffeine works. But either the brain becomes more adept at dealing with this buildup of adenosine, which normally makes you tired, or you start to just create more ATP uh, over time. Right. But um, the the fascinating bit for me is you think about um, now. I know one of your colleagues, Dr. Mike Triswicki goes up to University of, is it Cincinnati? Cincinnati, right? yep. Mm -hmm. And they've shown a reduction in concussions that I think they're somewhat linking to speed of recognition of things. Yeah. Uh, they do a lot of that type of uh, training. Uh, they may they may classify it differently, but, and again, I, there's been no research done with, with this app on that. But, but again, my thought process is, if I'm in a fatigue state, and that, that duration to fatigue is longer and I'm in that fatigue state and my speed of recognition of things is still quite high relative to what it was. Mm -hmm. My decision making is better. Maybe you can also reduce concussions because you see that thing coming or because it's not, not terribly different than I think what they're trying to do at uh, Cincinnati Absolutely. for different reasons. But I just don't think right. they're inducing the fatigue. Mm -hmm. And and this is the thing about a FitLight or a DynaVision or those kind of things. I know we might be using those to map the superior colliculus or something like that, mm -hmm. but they're not, or for whatever reasons. But uh, but if we think about them as a tool to create fatigue, they, you just people aren't doing them long enough to induce the fatigue we we need to, according to the research, to create this improvement. So it's pretty stinking monotonous stuff, but it's um, the upside is incredible. It is, yeah. Yeah, the stuff they're doing out there is pretty cool, and we're trying to incorporate that uh, a bit into uh, what we do here with Sports Performance Enhancement Program that uh, Dr. Mike is working on and yeah. some other stuff. But, yeah, yeah, this, this, has been, this has been really great so far, Dr. Nick. Um, we're just about out of time, though, yeah. so I wanted to make sure that I gave you the opportunity to give us any final thoughts uh, before we have to close. Well, I would say that uh, I would just encourage people to keep questioning and stay interested. And, uh, you know, if you think you're getting a result for a certain reason, you know, try to determine if that's really the reason. I think that's what that's what leads to need exploration and, and change and that, you know, we need to keep expanding our models and um, and and being comfortable with learning something that doesn't it might invalidate the why it doesn't change what what got better but it might change our thought process as to why it gets better but it doesn't mean people were doing the wrong thing right. and i think we're too easy to just fall into our trap so i would just you know encourage people to keep being curious that's great yeah perfect so if anyone wanted to find out more about you and your clinic maybe any other projects you're working on like the fnor series um how how would they go about doing that uh, absolutely. I have to say we need to up our social media game, but there is a website. It's www.drstudhome.com. And, uh, and then if they're interested in the FNOR, it is, uh, www.fnor.net, N-E-T. Okay. And either of those are a great way. I'm always happy to, to talk to people if they reach out to me. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you again for, uh, coming on the show today and taking time out of your schedule to talk with us and fill in the fill the listeners in on uh, what you do and you know the wonderful work you're doing out there in denver and really all over the world so thank you thanks joe i appreciate you having me on
course. And this has been uh, your host, Dr. Kappas. Be well. Thank you.